Well, good morning again. Uh, we repeat the session organized by the uh, Rising Public Awareness Committee of the Mathematical Society. The next speaker is Scudero, an professor of the Autonoma University of Madrid, research faculty member of the Institute of uh, Mathematical Sciences. Uh, Carlos is an on the use of uh, stochastic processes, in particular dealing with uh, stochastic differential equations and diffusions. And today he is going to talk about diffusion in uh, spending media. Well, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. It's a great pleasure for me being part of the Diderot Forum. And I'm going to talk about diffusion in expanding media, which is a talk based uh, in a collaboration with uh, two professors from the University of Extremadura, Enrique Abad and Santos Bravo Juste. A remark before starting is that uh, this work is technical. However, the talk will be uh, semi-technical due to the nature of the forum. Anyway, if someone is interested in uh, the technical details, please, uh, please feel free to ask me. So we have uh, basically two things in this talk, diffusion and expanding media. So we start with diffusion. And the, uh, the notion of diffusion is very much linked to Brownian motion. Brownian motion is named after uh, this man here, Robert Brown, who in the 19th uh, century observed the random motion of pollen particles in water. And uh, well, this random motion was theoretically, uh, theoretically explained by Albert Einstein in the 20th century. And uh, well, it was explained in terms of random collisions of these pollen particles with the water molecules. A, subs a subsequent uh, experimental experimental demonstration of the theory by Einstein was carried out by Jean Perrin, and actually Perrin got the, the Nobel uh, Prize in physics because of, because of this, because of his uh, experimental demonstration of the uh, discrete nature of matter. And uh, we have to move now a little bit farther in time to Norbert Wiener, who was the first who described uh, in mathematically precise terms uh, Brownian motion, which is called uh, the Wiener process also, because well, in, uh, in the memory of, of, Normer, of Norbert Wiener, the Wiener process or Brownian motion, it's a, a stochastic process, which trajectories are with probability one, everywhere continuous, but nowhere differentiable. Okay, so in terms of regularity, they are not, let's say, the nicest mathematical object. But however, there is one thing that is great, really fantastic about Brownian motion. That is, if you want to calculate the probability of finding your random walker in a certain, in a certain point of space at a certain time, all you have to do is to solve this uh, very simple linear PD, which is called the uh, diffusion or heat equation. Because it, uh, well, it, it was used to model diffusion of, of heat in a solid or diffusion of a solvent of a solute in a solvent. And well its solution can be computed in many cases. For instance, its fundamental solution is a Gaussian with a variance that increases in time and in the case of R2 it is the it is depicted here. So this is uh, a very summarized version of diffusion which is pretty much well understood in uh, simple, nice, and static domains. But what happens if the domain is uh, dynamic? OK, first of all, why, why we want to understand diffusion in a dynamic domain? As always, we can always uh, say there is a pure theoretical interest. OK, we, we understand it in a static domain. Let's move to the dynamic domain. Let's see what happens. But apart from the pure theoretical interest, one can at least side uh, two applications. One is cosmology, because the universe is expanding. Okay. So 
this, there is a clear motivation to study what happens on something that is expanding. And the second one is uh, developmental biology, because living beings grow. And because there are many, uh, many important processes in biology uh, mediated by diffusion, it is important to understand what is the interplay between diffusion and the, and the growth of the, of the media in which diffusion takes place. So to be a little bit more concrete, let's, let's start with the, com with the cosmological example. This is a nice picture of the evolution of the universe by NASA. And well, as you know, all started with a big bang. OK, as, as you can hear in the drama series. And uh, you find that a short time after the Big Bang, there is a dramatic increase in the size of the universe, which is the inflationary period. And then uh, you see that this expansion of the universe slows down, but the universe is uh, expanding for all times. Okay? And now we are here. And you, uh, maybe you can see that actually the, there is an accelerated expansion, uh, a accelerated expansion of the universe nowadays. And it's important to, to remind that the observational proof of this fact deserved uh, the, no the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2011, so not, not so long ago. So from this picture, it is clear that the universe has been expanding all of the time. Now. OK, it's, it, it's expanding, but how about diffusion? Is diffusion important in this case or not? Well, these are just a sample, a small sample of articles published in, in top astrophysical journals in which people study the diffusion of cosmic rays in, expanding, uh, in the expanding universe. And the approach in all of them is, as far as I know, uh, purely phenomenological. So this is about cosmology. How about uh, biology? Then uh, I would like to cite a work by Alan Turing, a very important mathematician in the 20th century, and one of his seminal works in applied mathematics, the chemical basis of morphogenesis. In this article, uh, Turing introduces a system of reaction diffusion equation, which shows an instability that is purely medi mediated by two different uh, diffusion coefficients. And this instability gives rise to patterns, OK? So some uh, to a special structure, like the one shown here in this uh, simulation. And during years, these patterns were somehow associated to the patterns that can be seen in, uh, in animals, to, in the coat of animals, OK? Like the, like the patterns in the coat of this uh, leopard. OK, visually, you can see, well, you can somehow claim that uh, these patterns remain, in some, to some extent, the patterns in the, in the animal. But more recently, people have argued that the Turing instability is not the best uh, mechanism to display these patterns, because it's not robust enough. And in biology, you require certain robustness to see this. Uh, but some other people argue that, OK, these reaction diffusion equations that were posed in static domains maybe should be posed in dynamic domains, uh, in particular in domains in expansion. Because uh, the expansion of space interacts non-trivially with the Turing instability and makes, makes it more robust. Okay. So maybe this, the interplay of these two factors can be uh, an explanation of, of some of the patterns found in nature. Again, well, this is a small sample of articles. And uh, basically the same idea as before. The introduction of diffusion in an expanding space is phenomenological. So this is why, at this point, we decided that it was a good idea to try to build a, th a more fundamental theory, not just a pure uh, phenomenological theory. So we started with a microscopic model. So maybe this picture is a bit, a bit too complicated for the current purpose, but let, let me explain it in simplified details. We will consider the process in discrete time. Okay, so we have uh, the evolution 
delta t, two delta t, etc. And we have two, uh, two factors, expansion of space and the Brownian jumps. So we can consider, for instance, this our delta t, we can consider. We are expanding the space all of the time, and at the end, we jump. Okay? This, is a, this is a valid model. But also, we can consider first the jump, and then expansion. Okay? Or we consider uh, all of this, our delta t. So we have some expansion, then a jump, and then expansion again. Okay? So the jump can take place anywhere in this interval. Right? All of these are valid models, valid microscopic models. We are going to the continuum time. And okay, let, let's see what happens in the continuum time. I'm remarking this because it's not clear that all of them will lead to the same uh, continuum time model. If you are used to stochastic integrals, uh, such as the Ito integral, then you, you may know that integrating with respect to the Brownian motion, we, what we just introduced a few slides before, is not uh, understandable in the Riemann sense. Because Brownian motion is not of bounded variation, so you cannot make sense of it as a Ito integral. In particular, if you do it as a, uh, if you try to build this integral as a Riemann integral, upper sums and lower sums they do not converge to the same value. Okay, so it's not Riemann integrable. Basically, the result depends or on in which part of the subintervals in the Riemann sum approximation the integrand is evaluated. Okay. So the idea here somehow. Reminds, uh, reminds me the same. I have, I have a jump in some time interval. Okay? I'm going to the continuum time. So maybe, in principle, I could have different continuum limits depending when the particle jumps. Right? Okay. Before starting with, with building the equation, I will start with one simplification now. It's not necessary at all. I'm doing this only, only for, for the sake of clearness here. How can we write in ge this is just uh, notation. How, how can we write in geometric terms the expansion of a space? Okay? We write it in this way. It's what is called in cosmology the friedman lemaitre robertson walker metric. All we are considering is, is a flat space, let's say Rn, okay? and any differential is, uh, part of a space undergoes an expansion, okay? which is perfectly isotropic and uniform. And we will assume that this expansion is a power law. There are two reasons for this. First one is uh, a theoretical reason that we will explain later on. Second is that uh, from the applied viewpoint, it is interesting to study a power law. Here are two examples. If you consider the models of a radiation-dominated universe, then you have the, the scale factor goes like the square root of t. And in a matter-dominated universe, it goes like t to two-thirds. So does this mean that only power laws are interesting? Not at all. In a dark uh, energy dominated universe, you have an exponential increase. Okay. What happens with biology? Of course, biology is much more, diffi much more difficult to quantify than cosmology. But mo most probably in biology, you have a little bit of everything. Okay. So the conclusion is, from an applied viewpoint, power laws are not the only interesting thing, but they are interesting. The theoretical reason will come, will come uh, a few slides later. So now we start building our model. So we have that in, uh, in the near future, the position of our random walker, it's the position now expanded plus a random, a random jump. Okay? This is one possible construction of Brownian motion if you consider gamma zero, this means no expansion. This means the classical case. And you, what you find in this case is just a discrete approximation of Brownian motion that converges to Brownian motion in the continuum. Okay. So now I see uh, many students here. So this is a question for the students. In this model, when is the, is the particle jumping? Beginning, end, middle? No answer? Okay. Uh, it's jumping at the end, yes. But you're not a student, right? So this is. <laughs> but 
but it's right. It's jumping at the end. We have our position at time t, then we expand it, and then we jump. Okay? So why do, what, what do we need here if we want to consider the jump at the beginning? Now a real student? No? OK. I will tell you this in, in uh, well, no, I can tell you now. We need a bracket here and a bracket here. OK, we open the bracket here and we close the bracket here. So we jump and then we expand everything. Right? So this is at the beginning. Uh, we are interested in very small increments of time. Okay, so we can tailor expand the, the drift of the stochastic equation, and we get uh, this thing here. And then it's very easy to, to go to the continuum limit and find this stochastic differential equation. What happens if we consider uh, the other type of jump? Okay, so we place brackets here and here. Then these brackets should be here and here. So we get basically the same plus one extra term, which goes like delta t times delta y, right? OK, when we go to the continuum limit, this goes like dt to 3 half. Okay. So this is 0 in the continuum limit. If, if you are, sorry that I have no time to introduce stochastic calculus, but if you are familiar with stochastic calculus, you'll retain terms that go like dt and square root of dt, which more or less db here, the, the increments of Brownian motion. Okay. So yeah. what, what does this mean? That actually, this continuum time model is well defined. We don't have to care about when the jump takes place, okay? which is good, of course, because we don't have to add any other modeling assumption. The, the, the microscopic model is totally well posed. Now, what can we do with this model? It's simple enough, so we can solve it. First of all, I will move to the fokker planck equation. Just as in the case I mentioned, with respect to Brownian motion, we can find a parabolic equation uh, for the probability of finding our random walker at position y time t. I'm writing things in one dimension, but you can do it in any dimension. This is pretty much straightforward from this calculation here. How do we solve this? We have to do this little trick. Change variables and consider a new space uh, variable x, which is y divided by the scale factor. Okay. This is what is called in cosmology co-moving coordinates. If we do this, we turn this equation into this other PD. What is the advantage of this new PD? Well, it's, it's quite simple. If you solve this equation in y, which is the actual physical coordinate, y is moving, is expanding in time. So if you are to solve this equation in a fixed domain, in a fixed interval of the real line, this interval is growing in time. Okay. If you change variables this way, it's easy to prove that the, the, uh, the initial length of the interval remains constant in time. Okay. So you can, do, you can uh, use all, your, all the standard machinery for solving PDs. And I will not enter into more technical details. After this trick, we can get the exact solution in many cases. For instance, the fundamental solution is written here. And it very much looks like the solution in the static case. But uh, we have to introduce this, this tau, which somehow plays the role of time. And it's given by this integral, and it's called conformal time also in, in cosmology. Good, so we have a well-posed model. We have the exact solution. So what, what can we do with the exact solution? What can we learn from the, from the exact solution? We can calculate, for instance, the standard deviation exactly. Okay, it's given by this value here. And it's easy to see that, uh, note that this is for any dimension. This little d is the, the space dimension. Okay. It can be seen that for uh, long times, uh, it goes like the square root of t if gamma is smaller than 1 half. So somehow, you can see that. Uh, this diffusion is, is propagating like the square root of t, at least if the growth of the space is small enough. I will be now a, bit, a little bit more precise. Let's calculate the probability of finding your particle in a hypersphere with radius uh, the standard deviation. Okay. 
in this case, we have this somehow complicated factor here. But somehow complicated, but very simple, in fact, because it does not depend at all on the expansion, on the diffusion constant, on time. Okay, so it's only on, on space dimension. So it's actually very, very simple. What does this mean? This means that I start with a bunch of particles at the origin, at time t naught, the origin of time, and I let them evolve. I will have always, for all times, this fraction of particles inside this, hyper, this hypersphere. Okay, this is what, what this means. So you can see somehow that you have a diffusive uh, pulse propagating in your uh, expanding space. Okay? This is what you see. And this, this pulse grows like y bar. This is like the square root of t. Okay? So there is a characteristic velocity in the propagation of diffusive pol uh, pulse that is the, the square root of t. So it is interesting to compare these two characteristic velocities we have here how diffusion propagates, and how a space grows. Okay? This is why it is interesting to have a power law in the expansion of the, of the metric, in the expansion of the space. Few words about this formula. As I told you, it's, well, it's very simple because it only depends on dimension, so it's a universal constant, but uh, looks a little bit ugly because it depends on the lower incomplete gamma function and the ordinary gamma function. Actually, you can find well, some ideas that makes it a bit simpler, for instance, it's always in, in, uh, in this range, in the open interval one half one, so this means that most of the particles are inside the, the diffusive cone, okay, so this is um, in, in consonance with what we want, right? Most of the particles are in our diffusive cone. And also, if you give some particular values, you have uh, very simple expressions. Simplest uh, is probably in dimension two. It, it only depends on e, the number e. In dimension three, okay, it's simple, but not not as simple. But it's, there is a nice coincidence here that I would like to to tell you. This probability exactly coincides with the following probability. Let's consider a classical ideal gas in thermodynamic equilibrium. Right? Then. Well, if you are familiar with the statistical mechanics, you know that the velocity of the particles in this gas is a random variable that is Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed. Okay? It is distributed according to this distribution, whatever it means. So the probability of picking at random one particle from this gas and finding that its kinetic energy is lower than the mean kinetic energy of the gas is, this is what is written here, is exactly this probability. Okay? So you despite the apparent complexity of the formula, you find really simple ideas behind it. OK, so now uh, we have learned something. Okay, for instance, that the interesting expansion is given by power laws. Let's try to learn a little bit more, basically about localization of diffusing particles in your expanding space. Now we are going to consider the following problem. Consider our uh, a single uh, random walker at the origin, at the origin of time. And any hypersphere centered at this point of an arbitrary but fixed radius. Right? We want to compute which, uh, what with probability the walker will leave this hypersphere right? at any time. Okay. Of if, if, or on the other hand, if it is going to be confined in this hypersphere for all times. Right? You, you can see the problem, right? What is? If you consider the static space, this is a classical problem that is solved. Also, if you consider just the hypersphere moving away, okay, this is this is solved. This is not the problem. Okay. Now there is a dilation of every infinitesimal of space, and this is, to the best of our knowledge, not not was not addressed before. Well, uh, I'm not going to to give any details on the proof, but just a summary. If gamma is smaller or equal than one, that one half, this is if the space is growing like the square root of t or slower or with a slower rate, then this probability is zero. In other words, with probability one, at some time, 
the particle leaves this, the, hy the hypersphere, okay? which is basically the classical result with a static space. However, if, the, uh, if gamma is greater than one half, this is the rate of expansion, is uh, faster than the square root of t, than the square root of time, then there is a finite probability of leaving the hypersphere and a finite probability of staying inside. Okay? So if, if, if you want, there is a finite probability that the particle will never leave this hypersphere, will stay inside for all time. Sorry. Probability which is not one, it's finite. In either case, what's zero? Okay? And somehow, well, when we found this result, this reminds me some, somehow of Galton Watson processes that Miguel introduced in the talk before. Okay, with the, basically the, the probability of extinction of the surname can be one or finite, okay, never zero. You, you always have a positive probability of extinction. So somehow, in this respect, it reminds me of that. And uh, we can still look to a concomitant quantity, which is the following one. It's the, well, the, what is called in technical terms, the mean first passage time. Let's consider again the same problem. Now, instead of looking at the probability of leaving the hypersphere or staying inside, we will look for the first time we cross the boundary and leave the hypersphere. Okay. Every, everybody knows what I'm talking about. This is a random variable, of course, okay? because in some realization, you will, this, this can go very fast. In other realizations, you can round, uh, go around the origin really for a long time before leaving. Okay, so we cannot really find, in general, we won't find an explicit uh, value for the random variable. This is the, the full probability distribution. Okay, Som sometimes we can, sometimes we cannot. At least we can calculate the mean value. Hmm? The average sign, we leave the hypersphere. So this result, of course, is very much related with, with the previous one. If gamma is uh, smaller than one half, then it's finite, okay? This matches with probability one of living. Okay? Uh, again, is the for the for a slow increase in the in the expansion of space. If the expansion of space is faster than the expansion of diffusive pulses, then we have that the mean first passage time is plus infinity. Okay? Again, this this goes well with the finding a finite probability of staying inside. Basically, in s some samples of a stochastic process will cross the hypersphere, other samples will stay inside. When you average the samples uh, that stay inside, they have a lot of weight, a, a lot of probably uh, big probabilistic weight. Okay? So this makes the average to, di to diverge. What happens in the critical case exactly when the expansion of space is the square root of time. Then we have a marginal result. What do I mean by marginal? Well, things are no longer universal, and they depend on the parameters of our model. To be simple, not precise, depend on the diffusion constant. Okay? If the diffusion constant is large enough, and we have made completely precise why, why, uh, I, do, why I mean by large enough, then it, uh, this, this passage time will be finite. However, if the diffusion constant is small enough, then this, uh, this mean first passage time will be divergent, will be infinite. So now we will move to, to my conclusions in this case. First of all, we have found uh, from a microscopic model the, descri the description of the random walker in a diffusive, in a expanding space, sorry. And we know this model is well posed by the reason I told you, okay? It's basically doesn't, uh, doesn't see the discrete approximation I'm using. Second, we can solve this model exactly. I didn't show you that, but you can solve all the paths. You can solve the probability, this is in, in which I focused. You can find any moment, you have really a lot of information explicitly by means of closed formulas. And uh, what can you learn from these formulas? To be really uh, short in this, 
we can focus on the first passage properties, okay, my last uh, two slides. In this case, and roughly speaking, we conclude the following. If the expansion of a space is small enough, then you cannot localize your particle. Okay? For long enough times, it can be anywhere in the space. However, if you look for, uh, if you uh, consider a space that is growing fast enough, then you have kind of confinement. Your particle is kind of confined in a bounded region of your space. Okay? This is kind of, of simplified conclusion of the last two slides. And well, if you want to see these results or many other, many more, actually this is much more generalized and much more technical than what I showed you. You can see this paper, which is uh, finished, but in the in a preprint stage, and that's it. I thank you your attention. Well, thank you very much for for your talk and uh, well questions, please. Just a second, please. In the biological case, yeah. I wonder if the, the expansion of the space is related with the, let's say, metabolic processes that are inside. So metabolism in a cell, for, ex for instance, is related with the expansion of the space. So this means that the expansion of the space is regulating the biological processes. How, in which way you could have into account this in your models? Well, this, this, is, uh, this would be quite a sophisticated model, right? Uh, well, we have been focusing on the pure probabilistic uh, problem we, because we have seen that there was a lot, a lot of room to work there in, in, in theoretical terms. But if you look at the uh, math biological works, then what they do is, is fairly simple compared to what you are su suggesting. This is purely ph phenomenological. They just consider conservation laws to get the reaction diffusion uh, and, let, and, and let the domain in which the reaction diffusion equations are solved grow. Of course, what you said, this is, this is, a, well, this is a, somehow a strong simplification and you need this kind of feedback. But as far as I know, this has not been done ever. So that would be completely new, as far as I know. Okay, more questions? Well, Carlos, uh, you have been talking about a concrete application. In particular, you have given an inter uh, the probability P bar. And I wonder if you have other intuitive interpretation of this probability, but in other applications. Well, uh, what I can tell you about P bar, these are two, uh, two particularly simple examples. In dimension one, it's somehow not that simple, but simpler than this, because you can express everything in terms of error functions. But there is a mm, somehow simple probabilistic interpretation in any dimension. It's, uh, the simplest is in uh, even dimension, because then the arguments become integers. And then this probability is exactly the same probability of a random variable that is Poisson distributed with parameter d half to have a value greater than the half. So in probabilistic terms, this formula is, it can be so uh, think of, th thought of in, in simple terms, as the one I said, for at least even dimension. In general dimension, you have a very similar construction, but you need, uh, because this basically, the problem is that this is not integer anymore, so you need uh, to use gamma distributions not just uh, Poisson distributions, but you have something which is very much analogous. Yes. Yeah, um, well, while listening to you, I always was imagining like typical case of R3 and sphere 
growing, yep. right, and diffusion inside the sphere. But I wonder, um, in the real case of cosmology, do we know the shape of the manifold of the universe? I mean, in my head, I, I have not, I have not knowledge of this. I don't have. Um, I mean, the manifold is R4 with some metric, and then you can imagine it in R5 expanding some way. But uh, the question makes sense. <laughs> no, what, what I can tell you is that we have considered a flat metric. This means we have worked, and we, I have so a very simplified picture of, of the calculations. But we have always worked in R, RD, Rn, whatever you call it, right? In arbitrary dimension but with a flat space. If you go to real cosmology, uh, then I have to say that I'm not a cosmologist, but people there, sometimes they consider curved spaces, not a vanishing curvature as in our case. But this, this metric can be really generalized to any curvature, and uh, you know this is sometimes done. But uh, I must say that at least in the works we have been reading, diffusion is always seen in, in the flat spaces. And even other cosmological questions are posed in, in flat spaces. I don't know if maybe it's because of analytical tractability. Maybe this is the reason. I'm not sure. But I mean, if we haven't done it, but if you want to do it, at least I know how to start. We can write the metric, and we can write the equations in that metric, and then we can try to, to extend the calculations. So in principle, I mean, it's not done. In principle, technically, it's possible to do it. I don't know if, you, and as I said, it's clear how to start. If you will find uh, technical complications along the computations, then this I don't know. But at least numerically, you will be able to do it. Well, thank you, Carl. Thank you. We don't have more time for questions. So let's take again to the speaker.